You're listening to the In Search SEO Podcast by Rank Ranger. That's right. You are listening to the In Search SEO Podcast, the podcast that paints a town red with exquisite search marketing insights. We have a great show for you today. Get ready, get set, folks. Kevin Indig is here to work your brains and your glutes with some SERP feature deep diving. We'll get into SERP features being organic, huh? The useless rhetoric around SERP features, the topic layer, what it is, and why you should care. Google targeting users via SERP features. I could go on. We're going to get into it all. But before that, I have a vision of a ranking signalist SERP that I want to share with you. I am your host, Morty Oberstein, and I am joined by she who is named after a blue rock, Sapir <laughs> Carabello. Hi, Morty. Hi, Sapir. How's it going, blue rock? <laughs> Sapphire, <laughs> right? Sapir? I, kinda, yeah, I just realized Sapphire. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all, really? this all this you time. All this time. I All oh this God. time. <laughs> From now, I'm yeah. calling you Precious Blue Rock. Oh, no. God, no. <laughs> Rock for short. Sapir You're the rock. Fine. You can just call me Sapir. Thanks. Okay, Blue Rock. <laughs> How's your, what's new, Blue Rock? Oh, yeah. Anything interesting? <laughs> no, nothing new. Did nothing you watch the space the shuttle ordinary? blast off? Ah, uh, no. I just saw it trending on Twitter. It was cool. My oh. uncle was was there the first time. They oh, really? The, yeah, they when they called it off, he was there. Sucks for oh. him. He spent like three hours going down there and. <laughs> they called that's it back. off. Yeah, well, you know, it could be worse. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, I, ha- I, I currently have three children home, sick, three out of oh. four. Oh, no. So if someone busts in here and screaming, that's why. Which, by the way, is <laughs> frightening when your kids get sick during COVID. Like, is it COVID nineteen or is it just right. allergies? Wow. I don't know. I'm on like DefCon five here. I'm like, okay, okay. How are you breathing? Are you breathing okay? <laughs> Do you do you feel like you have COVID? I'm four. <laughs> What's COVID? Right. So yeah, that's a lot of fun. I bet. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so nothing's new with you, like to completely. Yeah. I love when I ask you that question. Like I get nothing. Because nothing's going on. So uh, you just like you work, you get up, home. you work. I've been stuck you go at to home sleep. for like three months now. Yeah, but there's like, there's got to be something else going on in your life. No, I'm telling you. How's your boyfriend? Nothing going on. Who? Your boyfriend. I'm single and ready to mingle. So, oh, okay. And it, <laughs> all, to all of our listeners out there, Sapir is single and ready to mingle. What are your preferences? Uh, what do you like? Long walks on the beach? Disco let's, disco let's dancing? Not, let, let's not talk about it. Oh, come on. <laughs> too weird. Okay. Um, oh, okay. On another note, I took two days off, like for a holiday. I, I went, I went Amish. Like I turned off everything. No, so like, no social media, no anything. Two days. Oh wow! Yeah, and I, I woke it. up. It was, I, it's great. It's like, it's like a, it's like when you drink that green stuff and cleanses you out before a colonoscopy. It's very painful, but you feel cleaned out afterwards. <laughs> okay. Um. I don't think you drink the green stuff before a colonoscopy. I think you drink something else. Whatever. I never had a colonoscopy, so I wouldn't know. Anyway, you anyway. I come back I come back online and the world's gone to hell in a, in a handbasket real quick. Right. Yeah. I I don't want to get too political. Yeah. On this platform, but I will say, having spent two and a half years teaching in an inner city elementary school, our job is to uplift young people, show them love, and show them they have value. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to this, we fail. Every single time, and I'm very upset about it. Right. And that's all I'm going to say about this. Do you want to get my personal musings on it? You can reach out to me privately. But I'm I'm very okay. upset. It's very very upsetting to watch this. Right. Anyway, do not forget on that shiny note. Do not forget. <laughs> We put out a new episode of the In Search SEO podcast each and every Tuesday. You can find it on Stitcher. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on SoundCloud. You can find it, of course, on the Rank Ranger blog or wherever great podcasts are found. And do not forget, you can subscribe and should subscribe on 
iTunes. Um, also, don't forget, check out our Twitter page. It's at in search underscore SEO. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter where you can get up-to-date information on the show and handpick curated things that you would like to read about SEO. I pick them, articles, tweets, all sorts of great SEO content for you. And then I put it into a newsletter and we email it out to you. So sign up for the newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter. Just go over to the Twitter page and the first pinned tweet is a link to the newsletter where you can sign up or on the main page on the Rank Ranger page or on our SoundCloud. We have a link. to. The- There's many places you can find a way to subscribe to our newsletter. So do that, please. We would love you if you did. Okay. Yeah. Um. Oh, also, also new release. New release, Rank Ranger has officially announced its Geo Insights report. This is cool, by the way. It's basically a giant. I can I can go into it very technically, or I can tell you it's basically a giant map of the whole world that you can zoom in and out of and see how you're ranking in any given location. Two ways to do it: you can divide it up by your business listings. Oh, here's all of my uh, Papa John's restaurants that I'm managing in Florida and check out their rank on the map, which location is doing well, which one maybe not doing so great. Or you can do it by location, like how am I doing in Florida versus Texas versus France. With that, you can do the same thing with visibility and, this is a kicker, SERP features. Am I getting feature snippets in, in Oklahoma, but not in New Mexico? Am I getting... Uh, are there more local packs that Google is showing for the keywords I'm tracking in Belgium as opposed to Japan? I don't know. But the Geo Insights report will tell you. Head over to the Rank Ranger blog, check out our release, check out the report, and have fun with it. Okay. All of that jazz out of the way. I had a great conversation with Kevin Indig, who is a bigger surf feature nerd than I even am, which is bizarre and amazing and, and just downright surprising. But before we get into all of that... I have to run a heretic, bizarre, baffling, say what kind of notion by you. I'm talking the idea of ranking signals as we've come to know them being irrelevant because I am placing one mighty risky SEO bet. The jackpot will be divided equally among the winning tickets. Sapir, what is your favorite ranking factor? Everyone has a favorite ranking factor. Don't feel bad. We all have one. What is it? What's yours? Links. Links. (laughs) Oh, you're a link kind of girl, huh? So you like long walks on the beach, <laughs> margaritas, disco dancing, and links. I hate margaritas, actually. Just to all the people out there listening who want to date Sapir, she loves margaritas, oh. long walks on the beach, disco dancing, and links. Uh, so you should head over to LinkedIn, look up Sapir Carabello, and try to sell her links because she loves them. Oh, God. No, no, please. No. Please no. sell her links. That's what she and, and then ask her out on a date while you're at it. That'll go over well. Stop it! Are you trying to play matchmaker right now? Okay, let's go back. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Um, no. So you no. like links, right? So let me ask you. Okay, yeah. let me ask you again. Sapir, what's your favorite ranking factor? Because I totally blew my joke. What? I blew my joke. You just play along. What's your favorite ranking factor? Links. It doesn't matter what your favorite ranking signal is. The Rock says. <laughs> You don't know what I'm talking about. Like, like, you know The Rock, I right? What you're talking about. The Rock? The Rock. Is that, you is heard that, The Rock, big guy, muscles, wait. bald. An actor, right? Yes, an, an actor. actor. You, yeah, I, yeah. You're just BSing me. You know who The Rock is. He used to be a wrestler. <laughs> oh, Back okay. in the day, his line was, it doesn't matter, whatever, whatever, whatever. Because The Rock says... Uh. Yeah. Okay. Guess. It okay. doesn't matter what your favorite ranking signal is because, well, I'm being a little hyperbolic here. Because I don't think Google uses ranking signals the way that we think they do. And I think they're going to become extremely less relevant as time goes on. That's what I have to say about that. You should explain what a ranking factor is. That is a good point. I should explain what a ranking factor is. Um, ranking factors are like these, like these signals we think Google uses and that Google has said they use to determine if a page should rank for a query. There are hundreds of them. There are hundreds of them. Um, they include things like links, as Sapir loves, links and margaritas, <laughs> long walks on the beach, and disco dancing. Links um, being HTTPS, meta tags, page speed, all sorts of good stuff. So like, if you think about it like this. As it goes, you enter a keyword. 
Google looks at the page that, that may be relevant to these keywords that you entered in and says, well, this one's got a bunch of good links and it's secure. It's fast. It's got long content. The URL is right. It has an image. Okay. We'll rank it number five. Because another page has more images or a better video or more uh, optimized H2s or whatever, whatever, whatever. And I feel dirty and I feel like I need to wash my mouth out after saying that. What? Why? That's pretty much it. Real? Uh, you, do you come on the show with me every week, read my blog content, and I just know, totally but... ignore what I what I say and what I preach? Or do you just like making me nuts? <laughs> Both. Both. <laughs> Well, I know what you like. Disco dancing, margaritas, long walks on the beach, and links. So, there. Repeat that one more time. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you like long walks on the beach, margaritas, oh, disco no, no. dancing. <laughs> oh, not that. Not that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, God. Okay. okay. I, I, I feel dirty because I don't think that's how it actually works. So right. what I just said is not really reflective of what I believe. Let, let me let's go back in time a little bit. Let me explain the history of how we got or how I got to where we, where I am now. Maybe you'll come along with me on this magical bus ride. The conversation around factors. I don't know if you remember this, but back in the day, there were tons of studies on ranking factor studies, and then we got a little more specific with niche ranking factor studies. And now Brian Dean does one, and we all go crazy on Twitter. But the way we got to the point where we were like, we love ranking factor studies to now we hate ranking factor studies was because of Rank Brain. Because Rank Brain said, okay, okay. So, um, you know, you might do a query. Let's say, let's take a query like, um, what is diabetes? And Rank Brain says, for this query or for this vertical, these factors are really important for this intent, but not so much for, for this vertical or for this keyword or for this intent. So imagine like, um, you know, you have a keyword like, you know, what is diabetes? And um, having an image on the page for what is diabetes is probably not a major part of user intent. Like, I don't need to see a picture of diabetes, whatever that would look like. like, like I, no, you're laughing. That's, that's the point. Like, it's insane. Like, what are you going to show me? Like a giant, a giant, like, you know, a supersized Coke? Like, diabetes. But, but let's say you did a query like um, how to make chocolate pie that doesn't taste like poo if you have diabetes. Wait, wait. So you're saying these factors are still important? No, I'm saying that. Okay, I'm saying two things. One is that we, with Rank Brain, the whole the whole thing changed, right? Take the query. Um, what I say? I forgot what I said. Uh, making chocolate pie if you have diabetes doesn't taste like poo. Okay, having an image there, even though it's a diabetes query, probably is way important, like every other recipe. Mm-hmm. Right. So different query, different intent, different factors become important. So I'm saying is like one is. The, that f- there is no such thing as this factor is important and this factor is not as important. It all depends on what, on what the vertical is and what the query is and what the intent is and all that good stuff. All things uh, being equal. That's one thing. Right. Still confused? I see where, where you're heading with it. Okay. Yeah. Good. Because the second stage is after that happened, right, where this factor, where there's no these more universal factors anymore. It's all very query intent dependent. Well, Google started really developing machine learning and got really good at understanding the actual content on the page. Like Google's looking at things way more intrinsically trying to actually understand the content because – and here's the issue. So you have this you know, this query, um, how do I make chocolate cake that doesn't taste like poo when I have diabetes? And Google says you need to have an image there because every recipe uh, page needs an image. You got to see what this cake that doesn't taste like poo looks like. But does that equal good content? Does having a a recipe page with an image tell you that it's a good page, good content? Or is that just a general correlation? Which one is it, Sapir? General correlation? Or does it tell you that's really good content? Oh, there's an image here. This must be good content. We'll wait for your reply. I'll call Adlai Stevenson during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'll wait for your reply. Or I won't. There's no need to reply. I don't remember what he said. Correlation. Yeah. Correlation. Like there's, there's no a signal or a factor by definition is indirect. It is just a correlation. Does not tell you anything intrinsically. So if we're saying, right, we got to the point where Google was saying, okay, you know, like rank brain, we're gonna understand factors for different queries differently, different intents, blah 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 blah. Right. But now we're even past that. 
Now we're at the point where Google's taking machine learning, and we say this all the time. Oh, Google's really getting good at understanding content, understanding what's on that page, understanding things intrinsically. Well, if Google's very good at understanding things intrinsically, once Google understands the content, does it need signals the same way that it used to? Right, probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Okay, so this is what Google machine learning has been doing. It's just like John Mueller said. He said it himself. And John Mueller is like the Jesus of SEO. Whatever he says is true. <laughs> okay. He has a whole post where he talks about Google looks at content from reputable sources for, for a particular topic or particular vertical and says, this is how content should be. And this is how it should sound. And then it compares it to other content from other non-super authorities and profiles it accordingly. Is that our, in other words, Google saying, okay, if you're going to talk about this topic, well, all the super authorities talk about it this way. I have a whole post on this. And if you don't align to that, well, then you're probably not talking about that topic the right way. Is that a ranking signal? No. So then it must not impact rank, right? I mean, it's not a ranking signal. But I just told you, John Mueller, who I told you is a Jesus of SEO, says that it does impact rank. How does that, how does that work? It's not a signal. It's not a signal. Right. That's not, that's not a single. It's just like Google understanding what it's reading. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Okay. Google is analyzing or what I call profiling content in all sorts of ways to build up that understanding. It's looking at word choice. It's looking at content structure and to get an understanding of what you wrote. And that precedes signals. By the way, I don't just mean like content per se. But Google's looking at, at, at profiling your content to understand your intentions, your motivations, um, which means they're understanding how authoritative your content is, how safe your content is, all that EAT kind of stuff at the mm. same time. So under, so understanding of what you wrote and who you are. Exacto mundo, dude. Exacto mundo. <laughs> to quote, dude. dude. <laughs> to quote Michelangelo from the Ninja Turtles. No, who? look. Forget that. Oh, boy. <laughs> Don't know who the Ninja Turtles are? Anyway. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Look, as Google gets better, the point is, Sapir, before you yeah. make me lose sorry. my mind. Sorry, sorry. Long walks on the beach, margaritas and links and disco <laughs> dancing. Google has a um, better and better way of understanding what content actually means using more and more machine learning training. And as it, as it trains its machine learnings, at, I just say machine learning, as it trains its machine learning properties, and as it gets better at doing understanding content, it's going to rely on signals less as time goes on. And by the way, if you want to see this sort of playing itself out, follow Bill Slosky, and he'll go through um, all the different patents that Google's using and how they're setting up content, understanding content categorically by verticals and uh, vectors and whatnot. You'll see in the patents that Google's trying to take a far more intrinsic understanding of content per se, which means, again, they don't need the signals the same way as they once did. Why use a signal for what you can actually understand? Which, by the way, point, I will say that it might be cheaper for Google to use signals in certain cases because Google has a budget. Google says, hey, well, if you had a ton of links from a ton of reputable sources, all right, obviously, like, you're a good, you know, you're a good page. You're a good dude. So we'll rank you well. We don't need to spend tons of resources analyzing your page that way. So I'm not saying they're not going to be the, oh, they'll, they'll never look at links. Even, you know, 10 years in the future. No, it might be cost effective to look at links. But mm -hmm. I'm saying as a construct. Anyway, speaking of where Google is heading and how it's advancing, I spoke with the great Kevin Indig about how Google is doing as such with SERP features. And away we go. Here comes another search marketing expert. It's time for an in-search interview. Welcome to another in search SEO podcast interview session. Joining us today is the Arnold Schwarzenegger of SEO. No, he's not Austrian. He's a real Bavarian. I don't even know that's accurate or correct or what that even means, but he's a weightlifting, data storytelling, mind stretching, SEO ass kicking VP of SEO and content at G2. He's Kevin Indig. Welcome. <laughs> that was probably the best intro ever. I get that a lot. That's like, listen, to be honest with you, this is the highlight of the interview. That was it. It's all downhill from here. I think you're gifted. I think you should be uh, an announcer or something like that. Thank you. I that would be. I would love to call a baseball game, but there is no baseball because we're all f 
screwed. I can't say the F word. I'm trying to say the F word. <laughs> Maybe soon again. Maybe I'll like five it. months. Yeah. I'll take it. I I'll love it. You. I would love to do that. <laughs> so how's it going? How's the uh, Corona lockdown? I don't know when this episode is going to air, but we are recording this in the middle of the you know quarantine nonsense that's going on. Yeah, it's good actually. I have to say, um, and I'm saying that uh, you know I'm very privileged and have only first world problems. But uh, I'm here in Germany right now with my family. And uh, we're okay, you know, like we're doing, we're doing all right here. Nobody's sick. Um, we're getting along with the crisis, doing our best. Um, and yeah, so far I can't complain, but ask me again in a month. I might okay. tell you a different story. <laughs> right. When you're all out of it. Wait, but the best part of being in Germany is you have like tons of Wienerschnitzel and beer. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That does make it right better. Now, but it, it, it's honestly there's there's the worst to have around you. I also got some weights so I can compensate for nice. all those insulin and beer and hoxa that I'm eating. How much do you bench? Come on, max, oh, dude, it's not max. Impressive. My, my my max is like two ninety, but it's honestly not that impressive. That's impressive. I know tons of no, I, no, I know tons of, tons of gym bros out there who bench three plates easily and all that kind of stuff. So right. like for my journey, like given my background, I'm honestly happy and grateful, and, and it's all good. But it's it's nothing ordinary. Mm-hmm. Just being very modest. Okay, okay. Do you lift for like pre- precision, like for for um for being cut or for bulk? It depends. I uh, cycle through, so sometimes I gain, sometimes I cut down. Um, I generally um try to hit my weight class or maximize my weight class. So I'm a power lifter, means I com- It's a strength sport, and I compete in three exercises: the squat, bench, and deadlift. And uh, it comes down to, you know, you have like at the at the meet or at the competition, you have three attempts for each exercise. You have to, to hit the heaviest one that you can in a given weight class. And I'm trying to actually go down a weight class and uh, we'll see we'll see how that works. But um, that that means like I constantly cycle through gaining and losing because, it you know, like you want to give the body another stimulus by losing a bit of fat. And if you want to gain more muscle, you have you have to gain weight and all that kind of stuff. It sounds great. Like, this is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Okay, l- last question, because I used to sort of lift weights like 15 years ago. Like nothing impressive. Like I was at 225, like max, whatever. But we used to have this debate. Do you have to work out your legs? And I'm a lazy person when it comes to this. I'm like, no, like you're rocking around all day. Like you're always on your legs. You don't need to lift with your legs. You never do like, you know, like where- leg squats or whatever. Do you? I like where this is going. I do, of course, absolutely. Of course. Uh, I love how we geek out about. <laughs> looking at me like a total slacker. What the stuff. hell are you talking about? Not doing legs. I love this. I love this because I geek out on fitness a lot. And so, here's my answer. Again, like take this from somebody who does not earn his his living with with fitness, but has stuck very deep into this matter. Um, and so, yes, you have to work out your legs because actually your biggest muscles are in the legs, right? Your quadriceps, for example, and. Uh, Meaning if you train the biggest muscles, you get the biggest hormone response from it, the biggest stress response. And you need a certain stress response for the body to adapt, to grow. And even if you want to grow, you know, like your arms or your chest or upper body muscles, there is a benefit from training your lower body because you just get a greater stimulus in total. Now, I still (laughs) think that you can build like a really good upper body if that's your goal, uh, without training your legs, but also, also it looks pretty bad. <laughs> right. And like um, if that's you hilarious. train, you know, if you train, if you're a man <laughs> and you train for women, then like there are women who care about a butt or a behind. Right, uh, right. That's I'm married. It's all over way. for me. But yeah, keep going. I don't know what you're talking about anymore. <laughs> I think we better stop. We can, right, cares about right. That. We can go down this wormhole for a long, long time. Okay, so we're talking I, SERP features. Because yeah. you love SERP features. And I have a setup question for you. You're going to be like, what the hell kind of question is this? But how do you define a SERP feature? That's a great question. First, oh, wow. before I answer that question, I want to uh, say a big thank you to you, Morty, because you gave me tons of amazing data from Rank Ranger to help me better understand where Google is going and what's happening. So huge thank you at this point. How do I Pleasure. define a SERP feature? A SERP feature is a, um, a non or let's call it a, a result out of the classic 10 blue links that Google provides in the search results. And I think at this point, I would actually exclude featured snippets because Google has integrated the featured snippet algorithm with the organic search core algorithm. But I would say anything that's unpaid, that's not paid, um, and that is outside of these 10 blue links uh, as a direct answer from Google as a search feature. So 
that's a great answer, but I was really setting you up for this. So a couple of weeks ago, you probably saw this. Danny Sullivan and Dr. Pete were fighting on Twitter. I mean, they were having a disagreement. They were fighting, whatever, uh, <laughs> on Twitter about this. Because um, Dr. Pete did a whole study about how the SERP features are pushing organic results down for the, you know, further down the page than they used to be four or five years ago. And Danny Sullivan was all, well, those are organic. You're, there's a URL in there. What do you say about that? Like, there's a news box. There's a video carousel. Those have URLs in it. That's true. That's very true. It depends, right? I think, like, like my big come to light moments at the beginning of this year was that there is not this concept of like temple links has pretty much died right most serbs develop this kind of diversified uh, number of results um, and we can dig deeper into the impact on traffic for all of the ranking sites but um, i think we have to kind of expand our definition of what an organic result is that's where i do side with danny sullivan however um, that also means that we have to kind of say goodbye to this classic um, F schema that we use to say this is where attention goes, like this, this right. trying on the SERPs, like that's definitely dead. Um, and just the notion of what SEO means in general, right? Like, so for example, if you want to rank on some of these SERP features, you need either news results, you need video results, I think also in the future audio results. So we're, we're saying goodbye to these classic formats. And I think we're saying hello to a world where SEOs have to think about like, how can I actually translate the written content into, for example, video, or how can I create news without kind of like, for example, in a situation where I'm actually not a new site or my blog doesn't have enough output. So raises all these questions. I do agree with Danny's answer, but I also agree with um, Dr. Pete's point, right? right? Like, I, I don't think that's, it's, it's completely um, mutually exclusive. Um, but what we definitely see is that when a lot of search features are present, a single site, even when it ranks on top, doesn't get as much traffic anymore. I think we can all agree on that. Yeah, so I, I kind of falls in a, maybe in a similar camp with that because I understand, okay, fine. Like, it, technically speaking, let's say it's a, a video carousel. So, you, yeah, you have a YouTube, your YouTube video is linked in there or it's a news box. But at the same time, your average site, and there's a lot of times a news box does show up and it's not like a news query, you can't get in. So, yeah, it is organic, but it's really kind of exclusive organic. And the video carousel, which shows up freaking everywhere, I call it the universal search feature. It just donates with everything. It's like it's video carousel, feature snippet, video carousel, whatever. Great. So you go to my YouTube channel, but I'm not in control of that platform. It's like my Twitter box. Okay, great. You went to my Twitter profile. I really much rather you go to my website. You know what? You want to hear my, my crazy theory about that? Sure. Yeah. I love crazy theories. <laughs> so it's actually not that crazy, but uh, I think that Google really banks on YouTube as a cash cow now. So I looked at the revenue numbers because um, last quarter, Google for the first time ever disclosed Google's, uh, sorry, YouTube's revenue. And what you actually see is that the revenue from Google ads is going down in relative terms, not in absolute numbers, right? It's right, still right, growth, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. absolutely every year, but actually it grew from 2017 to 2018 by 22%. And from 2018 to 2019, only by 15%. Yeah, I saw so the that. growth rate is going down a lot. This is a lot. And YouTube's share of total revenue is actually going up. And I think that they that Google is actually in a position where they need to find the next growth lever to keep performing the way they have, the way they have. Because Google Google is actually the most successful startup in history, period. Right? They've been raking up twenty percent revenue growth year over year since the last what, like twenty, twenty five years. Now, you know, like they had a really good um, opportunity when they discovered, uh, not discovered, but when they leveraged the increase of smartphone usage because it gave them a second real estate for their ads. That right? was yes, very, ads. very ahead of the curve what they did. That was amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was super smart and a blunt business move, you know. That's why that's my reason for why they pushed mobile so much. Not because everybody was using a mobile phone, but because it was like another revenue stream yep. for them. But now, how do they repeat that? And I think they're trying to make YouTube that. But the problem is that you can only show so many ads before the user experience gets really bad. I mean, you already see like double it's already too much. rerolls right now. It's like already The double bad. ad? The double ad thing kills me. Kills me. I hate that. Oh, dude. So, so Worse, stupid. Right? Like horrible. Not a good it's idea at same. all. No, not a good experience at all. And so that opens the space for a competitor to come in with a better experience. But at the same time, the revenue from YouTube Premium and YouTube Music is actually growing. And, of course, the ads from YouTube. So my 
to, to kind of uh, wrap that up, like my theory for why they show so many more video care results is because YouTube is important for revenue. That makes a lot of sense. By the way, if you, I know, you, I'm sure you've noticed this, but YouTube now has like a bunch of, I'll call them like SERP similar features, right? Sort of like these knowledge graph elements now are showing up on YouTube. Hey, I don't need to go to the SERP anymore. It's all here on YouTube. Yes, so that kind it's of all there. They have, they have stories now, which is yes. uh, whatever. I don't, I've it's never, kind of, I've only clicked on one by accident. It kind of makes sense. It's like a video platform. Yeah. Uh, I'm, or the, I'm the image posts where... they have. You ever see that? Like someone has like an image and it's like, I don't really, it's a video platform, you morons. But whatever. No, no, it's not. It's, it's a hybrid of a social network and a search engine to me. Um, but I'm curious to see what they take it. As you said, they have serp like features. They have um, some query refinements where they tell you like, uh, or basically where they show you the topics that you look for last. So you see a lot of kind of um, development actually on the YouTube side, also hashtag. I think hashtags yeah. were major for YouTube actually. It's another proof for why it's also have up a social network um, and for internal linking and all this other kind of stuff. Um, but I think they, for a long time, just let YouTube grow and now they pay a lot of attention to it and develop it forward. I wonder if after this whole COVID-19 thing that we're undergoing right now, which by the time this airs, we could be hopefully be out of, if Google sees like, whoa, 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 like this is a gold mine right here because you have to you have to imagine that YouTube ads are up tremendously because everyone's on YouTube like okay we need to figure out how to leverage this crap and then going forward we're going to see tons of video stuff on the strip to sort of segue you to YouTube yes yes I, I expect the same thing uh, I also expect by the way to come back to search features I do expect most featured snippets and direct answers to be replaced with videos yeah that makes, makes sense I saw you sense. say that that makes a lot yeah, of yeah. sense why do you think that you know it's a Yes, it's a better, it's a much better answer than a written text, right? Even if you like Google for something like how to bake a cake, how to change a tire, like a video, you watch maybe 10 seconds of this. Mm -hmm. You got the answer text. You need to read. You need to like, you don't understand everything. If you see something, it's much easier to comprehend. So I expect that. And visual also like, learning. the same thing with like, yeah, visual learning. Visual absolutely. learning. And it, again, it's like another entry point for, uh, to draw people into YouTube. Um, but also to get people used to video and more rich media instead of text. I think text is kind of, it still works. It's still valuable. Don't get me wrong, but it's kind of on a, on a declining path. So do you think audio is up and coming? Because I know you have the podcast carousels now. The, the problem to me with audio is that it is really intriguing. It, it, it does work. It's something you can listen to and do you know, multitask at the same time. At the same time, though, it's not as easy to find what you're looking for within the audio file I, itself. It, I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, I think you, um, Google is going to do the same thing as they do with YouTube, where they search through your transcript, and they can they can automatically transcript your stuff. They are good anyway. Right. Yeah, it's really good quality, and so that helps them to then create another search corpus or index, um, and then they can show you specifically the section of the video that you that gives you the answer to your question, and show you smaller thumbnails for different sections depending on how ambiguous your query is, right? How how clear or unclear your search is. Um, I think they're going to do the same with audio, mm -hmm. and um, they also recently revamped their Google Podcast. So I think that's another one where they just slept for a long time, and now they're revamping that. And the big, big race in podcasting is who is going to um, create a viable ad model first. And it's basically a race between Apple, Google, and Spotify. Uh, maybe I'm forgetting one competitor could be, but um, they the the big problem is how do you insert ads and build a sort of bidding marketplace because right now you don't really have that. So um, that's going to be really interesting to watch. And I think as soon as that's figured out, um, and I, I think Google can actually figure out pretty well, um, then I think they're going to push even further. But again, like audio and video results are usually, usually superior to text. Yeah, for sure. You really feel like you're learning something from the actual person who's giving it over to you because I got to figure this out myself with the text. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, okay, so we're talking about like surf future domination. You mentioned that, and I know it's sort of like a hot topic. I mean, it's been a hot topic for, I don't know, years already at this point, which I sort of feel why is like rhetoric. Yeah. Surf future dominating everything. It's so much harder, blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, right, I think we, uh, so many thoughts. So I got to slow myself down. There's, there's two problems with this one. It's, it's just rhetoric, Matt, what do you mean by that? Isn't it vertical specific? How does it play itself out? And don't you have the opposite problem in many industries that we don't focus on? For example, let's take health, very few health cert features. You have the health panel and that's pretty much it. Maybe you'll get a video. Maybe you'll get a news box. Probably not very, you know, feature snippet. That's about it. But for those top level high search volume health queries, it's impossible to rank. 
forget SERP features, right? Because you have, you have, I don't know, you have uh, Harvard, you have Hopkins, you have Healthline, you have Very Well Health, WebMD, Mayo Clinic. I can go on and on and on. It's not the SERP features killing you. It's just the, the ranking, the authority that Google loves so much is killing you. So when we speak about SERP feature domination, it's, it's a lot more nuanced than that, isn't it? Yes, I totally agree. Uh, and I also agree with your... Um with your sentiment on authority. Like there are certain verticals where it just doesn't make sense to build an affiliate project or a blog unless you're this kind of researcher or lawyer or an actual expert in the industry. And again, it makes sense, right? Like from, from Google's perspective, it makes a ton of sense. And to me, it comes back to a couple of things. And one of them is this kind of unwritten contract that Google had for a long time between webmasters and between users, right? It used to be this kind of symbiosis between three parties, right? Users get great search results. Google gets a lot of users to show ads to, and then uh, webmasters get a lot of traffic. And now Google rewrote that contract and singled out webmasters, right? So you, they, they don't care anymore if you, right? Like if you um, want to make money or want to get traffic, that doesn't matter to them. The only thing that really matters is to show highly authoritative results, the whole EAT thing, right? Um, and to show the best results. So. I agree, it's really hard next to impossible to rank if you're not an expert in the field. So what you could do is you could hire experts to write for you, right? Like you right. step in the background and hire. Yeah, that's, know, a, that's like, a long term plan. That's going to take years for you to pull that off. Oh, yeah, it can take you a really long time unless you have a niche where freelancers that, you know, where experts freelance or, or are ready to, to give their content away or you find a very creative way to display their content and, and leverage their authority, right? So I think this idea of authority hacking is, right. that's something that we're going to see more <laughs> That's of the next thing. I'll sell you 10 experts for, for $5. I'll get like LinkedIn messages now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting thought, you know. Uh, I, <laughs> I've, we, I've we got you going. On All right, well. Nice. <laughs> now you wait. You're going to see message from Kevin Iddig show up. I have 100 authority you know, figures. I will sell them to you. For ten dollars <laughs> each one for five minutes. Yeah, fiber of authority. <laughs> um, but no, I think I think we're gonna see much more of that. And yeah, I think that you know, like this whole kind of um, this whole kind of idea of authority is also being applied to SERP features, right? They really want to show the best result, and the best result is the one with the highest EAT technically. And it's it depends on the niche. We we'll also see other verticals or categories where that's not the case, where you still have very unauthoritative. Uh, sites rank because there is no real authority, right? Yeah, like e-commerce, yeah. you can't be like, you know, an economist doesn't have a higher authority in e-commerce or something right, like right, that. Right. So we have to distinguish between those, your money or your life verticals. By the way, it's really interesting that you mentioned, um, what should we call it? Um, uh, t- my tip my tongue, t- authority um, in terms of SERP features because I have this wacky theory is that, that Google's trying to do it. So, okay, we always think like, Google's trying to keep you in their own ecosystem. Google's trying to sort of direct where you're going, search as a journey kind of thing. But I have this theory that Google, yeah, okay, that's part of it, but what really what they want to do is they want to be an authority engine. In other words, like, what's going to keep me from going to Bing versus Google? Well, Google's authoritative. Like, I'm going to get this really authoritative looking um, layout format and results. The SERP features are a way to come, become authoritative. Even schema is a way to become authoritative, right? You scroll down the results and you get authoritative answers right there. You don't have to click on anything. It's like all about authority for me. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, that helps Google to to just be to just provide a better product. And what's also interesting to note is that actually people by nature don't necessarily choose the most authoritative result, because you would have expected that the most authoritative or, or sorry authoritative result wins in the search results. But then Google made this big push and changed their um, their their uh, rater guidelines, the quality rater guidelines, uh, to a version where they include EAT, right? So they, there, there was a, a distinct point where they started to pay attention to authority, expertise, mm-hmm. and trustworthiness. And it, you would have expected that to occur naturally, but it did not. So Google kind of gave extra weight to those authoritative results so that they rank on top, right? It's really interesting when you think about it. Yeah, more and by the way, I think it's like funny when people talk about, oh, does Google have a brand bias? No, I don't think Google has a brand bias. I think Google has an authority bias, and those brands are the super authorities, and that's why they're ranking. You're looking at it from the wrong angle. I agree, I agree. I, I even think you could probably fake a highly authoritative result with a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but I think you could Let's reverse engineer all the, the things, the, the, the factors or signals that they look at, and just pretend to be some sort of a hospital in God knows where in Germany that doesn't exist. You have to be a horrible fake. person to even think that, Kevin. 
horrible. You have to. You have, you have to. to. <laughs> right. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you've done a ton of work on, on um, Surfeature Trends, and I'm wondering what you've seen out there. Yes, yes. And again, like I, did, I, gave, I got so many great insights because of you. And no, so no there were a couple of. Happy to do it. Absolutely. Yes, yes. You Shout all, me at all you want, no, by the way. I'll, I'll, yeah, no, ta- no, I'll take it. Keep saying thank you. <laughs> good, good. Uh, so what I saw is a couple of things. So first of all, uh, feature snippets are growing across the board. Um, and when I'm saying across the board, I look specifically at three countries, uh, the US, Germany, and the UK. And they're growing well in the US, very strongly in Germany. So uh, I think I saw more than twice, like 2x growth in 2019 on mobile devices. And then in the UK, it's a bit ambiguous. I think they increase slightly on mobile, but decrease on desktop. And that brings me to the kind of the first surprise that I saw in the data is that mobile and desktop is very different. Yeah. You would expect that, you know, they, they run in parallel because wouldn't the same queries deserve a featured snippets on and, mobile and desktop? 100%. And, and they, they don't, don't. Even, they don't and they don't even show the same URLs. 10% of the time yes. they don't show the same URLs something like that. I should know I did the study on that, but I don't remember the numbers cuz I'm terrible at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll link true. to it. This is true. So different URLs, different keywords, different amount of um of of search results that show featured snippets. So I was specifically interested in the relative share of search results that show featured snippet. And so it's different from mobile to desktop. It's different from country to country. So that's also something I found very interesting that um, even English speaking countries show a different amount of serve features, right? So the same query in the US and the UK could trigger four different versions. Yeah. Um, like one different by language and one different by desktop and, and, uh, and mobile. So that was very fascinating. Um, and then Google even, I think they test a lot where they roll out featured snippets for specific queries, roll them back. So that's why you don't just see this gradual decline. It's pretty much more stepwise. And mm-hmm. then it doesn't always go up. It sometimes goes down as well. It's very, very, they're, they're always, every feature, um, image boxes, for for example, are, they're always testing image boxes. I'm always going back to the team like, okay, are they testing again or something wrong? That, or something, we're just not tracking this right. That's really my first question when I see something because like, it's so drastic sometimes. You wonder, okay, did something happen here that we're just not picking up? They, they changed the HTML, right? Which, which by the way, has happened. Like, for example, the Explore panels or the right-hand side of feature snippets. So when we first we, – they, they're gone. They're, they're not gone. They're now they're in the center. So we tracked it. They were totally gone. But now when we recalibrated the HTML because they, re, they readjusted it, okay, they're not gone. Here they are. They're just now in the middle. Which, by the way, quick question for you. Um, we're currently debating what to do with these things because beforehand we call them explore panels. They were on the right-hand side of the page. They were knowledge panels um, combined with a feature snippet sort of sort of look and feel. Now they're in the middle of the page. Now they're in the main results column. Are they featured snippets or are they a variation of a feature snippet? And there's a couple of things that sort of um, we're debating. One is visually they're just different. They have the, 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 um, the carousel, the image carousel. People also search for a carousel underneath it. And they don't necessarily rank number one. Yeah, I think I like that you that asked that question because it comes back to how do we define a feature snippet actually. That has changed on January 24th when Google um, confirmed that, that um, they stopped deduplicating URLs. So that's why this whole notion right, of right. the feature snippet algorithm is now part of the core organic algorithm. I think that's not the case for the Explore uh, panel that's now in the middle because it doesn't really push... Uh, or it doesn't kind of replace a result per se, right? It, push, it might push mm-hmm. certain results right, further right. down, especially organic results yeah, when yeah. it is on top. Um, but that's why I would still consider it outside of that. And it seems to focus much more on entities. Yeah. And I would separate this kind of whole knowledge graph topic layer from the organic results, at least for now, right? Like it could change, it could merge it. Um, so we have to be careful with that. But that's why I would still kind of, not call it a feature. Snippet. Cool. I'm leaning. I'm, I, I agree with you, especially because of the entity thing. We're still. I mean, currently we have them separate, and I think we're going to leave them that way for now. And by the time this airs, we'll already have an answer for you. But yeah, because they, they are sort of slivers of entities, right? You have like I don't know something like um, Facebook ads, like that will get an explore panel because it's a you know it's, it's a subcategory or a sliver of the entity that is Facebook. So it is very entity centric. So yeah, I agree with you. Sorry, I didn't want to put you in the spot like that, but. Kind of wanted your advice. No, 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 no okay. go, totally don't really. I don't mind this at all. I love these uh, spontaneous questions make me think a bit. But coming back real quick to uh, two more findings. So um, another thing that I found is that local packs are actually decreasing, at least in the U.S. That's something that absolutely stunned me, did not 
uh, correlate with my impression of local packs and also does not correlate with um, most people out there. Right. So I started this Twitter poll where I, of course, like small sample, but I asked my, my followers and a couple of other people, like, if you think the uh, number of local packs has decreased uh, sorry, has increased in the last 12 months, and that was uh, towards the end of 2019. And and two third of ev- of the voters said yes. Mm, we see more local packs than the SERPs. And then the data showed that that's actually not the case in the U.S. Which again, like I found very very interesting because like there's this weird situation where I searched for SEO in the Bay Area and I saw a local pack, and I'm like, this is just intuitively at least it is wrong because if i were to search for seo services or seo agency then it makes a lot of sense but just seo in itself like why would that trigger a local pack and then um a couple of months ago we had um gary Eish from mm-hmm. google over at the san francisco bay area meetup and i took a lot of notes and one thing that he said very um specifically was that they decide which universal search features to show in the search results based on the tab clicks. So if you search for something and you click on maps or in video or in images, uh, that is an in, a signal for cool. Google to say, okay, we need to show an image pack here or a video pack. But I highly doubt that people search for SEO and then click on maps. Yeah. So that was one where it was very... That's different. very weird. Because it, it is, by the way, because I always... It, is, it was surprising to me also because I always thought they're casting a wide net. Right, they'll show a local pack for something. It'll won't even be the top of the page. It'll be the bottom of the page because all right, maybe there's a local intent here. We'll throw it on the page. It is very interesting. Yes. So what that was interesting, and then the last time that I ever saw a bigger local pack uh, study or analysis was in was in 2015 when the triple packs replaced the seven packs. That was a study by Moz. So maybe there's a study that I'm missing or a research, or our perception is just not aligned with the data. Right. It, it's 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 hard because like the data set that I gave you is very normalized. So there could be a ton of things that Google say, you know, okay, we're scaling back like this this area of the world or this area of the, you know, the of keywords. It just doesn't make sense. So when we're searching for things that we expect to see a local pack, yeah, they're always there. They're always going to be there even more than we think they should be there, which is where I think where this comes in. Like we think like, wow, there's no reason that should be there. That doesn't mean that these sort of like periphery areas Google didn't pull it back on. Yes, very true. Absolutely. I mean, we always have to question the data. No doubt about yeah. that. That's why um, and then, I don't trust and, data, and, even our own. Like, I'm very, like, they hate me. Like, okay, like, what about this? I'm like, like, dude, more, just leave it alone. It's good. I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> well, you should. You no, but you should. have to. Like, you totally have to. I, the the yeah. worst thing my, in life for me, besides this stupid, stupid coronavirus, is when you do a study and you're like, okay, did I do this right? Was I biased in this? What am I missing here? I'm going to put this out there. Someone's going to call me out. This is, you know, BS. It's very anxiety ridden. Because you don't ever know, like, are you missing something or not? Yes, yes. I feel the same way, man. And that's, like, it was a, um, like, I recently gave a keynote here in Germany, like, a good, like, important conference uh, that was very proud to speak at. And I had the same feeling because Germans are very, very deliberate, very thorough, very skeptic and critical. So it's like, oh, am I going <laughs> to, like, stand on in front of 500 people and present all this data? And it was very well received. So, and that anxiety that you mentioned drove me to like spend hundreds of right, hours. Right, so you spent hundreds of hours, right, everything. that you don't need to do at all, but it's like you feel so much better afterwards. <laughs> right. But it's important, like to, to, on a serious note, like we need to hold ourselves to the highest standards when we evaluate those things because data is so hard to find, is relatively rare, and it, everything is so complex. Yeah, so it's very complex. So if we don't poke holes into this, we get on the wrong trajectory and we just, you know, like we, we live too much off of assumptions. But anyway, um, Focal packs, very interesting. And then lastly, image boxes and image thumbnails, also very interesting. Very. So actually kind of part of this whole journey that I put myself on where I created this huge presentation and, and research and dug into lots of data was uh, because in uh, September 2018, Google, or better said, Ben Gomez, the SVP of, of Search News and Google Assistant, which right, right. is a very interesting title, by the way, he wrote a long blog post on Google's blog for the 20th um, um, millennia of Google search. And he wrote about the next 20 years in search. And he made three predictions that actually shape everything that we see in search today. And a lot of people miss that. And one of those three predictions was that they go from text to visual results, right? And they, they, they kept their promise in, uh, I think March, 2019, they, um, the, the image boxes globally exploded. Yeah. So you yeah. see that overnight they, they, 
increased by, I think, 2x or something, and they're stable since then. So there was less a test where Google said, okay, let's see how this works, and we roll it out or increase it depending on the feedback that we get. There was a situation where Google was like, no, like we want more images or better said image boxes in the search results. So we're going to turn them up and we're going to leave them there. And then I, what I also did, and this completely blew my mind, was I also got a lot of traffic data. And then I correlated image boxes with traffic data. Oh, and I saw cool. that whenever an image box is present, your traffic is going down. And it's a very, very steep correlation of minus 0.7, which is really high, both on mobile and desktop. And so the way that I interpret this is that image boxes give less traffic to all the ranking sites because so many people click on the actual image boxes. And then you often, or sometimes you get into Google Images where you see another query refinement at the top and then continue your search that way. Uh, it's really fascinating to me because, again, it's a matter of perception. I always think the image boxes, they just kind of throw them there because I never use them. It's just like, all right, in case you want to see an image, we're going to put it here. I'm like, I, I almost feel like there's, there's throwing it there, sort of like casting a wide net, whatever. It, but it's interesting that there's actually traffic correlations because I, as a user, I never click on the image boxes. I won't yeah, even – if I, here, man. it's a funny thing because even when it's there, I just click on the image tab. Yeah, same here, same here. And so, and first of all, like I think the same thing happens with people also ask boxes, but I don't have the data to support that. And second is, man, like it, I had this funny epiphany where I watched my mother browse search results a couple of days ago, and then I was, dude, it's like it, honestly, if you want to ground yourself and sniff some coffee beans to be able to <laughs> to be receptive for perfume again, you know what I mean? Like if you want to do that for SEO, just watch your parents browse the search That's results. It will tell you everything that you thought was wrong. I have this idea. What I want to do is I want to ask like my siblings. I, I want to do keyword research on something. And I'm going to, you know, the most prolific set of keywords for every possible facet of the topic that I can possibly come up with. And then I want to ask like my siblings, like you pick something like, um, like a real issue that they're facing. Like, my, my stepbrother's mother passed away from MS like a, you know, years ago. So I would love to know, like do re keyword research on, on MS and then see what questions he would actually ask and see if they line up or not. Yeah. I agree, man. I think there's a, a business play where um, you would provide something like user testing just from real people where you ask them to perform queries and get the best uh, result and you just monitor what they do, man. Yep. It's, like, it's like SEO user testing in a way and I think that's something that we should do much should more should totally do that because I would imagine that it's completely different. Very, yeah, very yeah. different. I, same here. Same yeah. here. And I see people browsing completely different. So that's how I make sense, sense of stuff like like image boxes or PAAs, which I personally never use. Never but use I'm it. the wrong sample. Right. Either. Yeah. It's funny, by the way, on the images, I was just looking at the other day. If you go back to 2017 or 2016, whatever it is, you can like clearly see like these enormous increases of images. Like, every every yeah. vertical, like image thumbnails, image boxes, image whatever. Just it's yeah. like it looks like it's like Mount Everest at a certain point. It's just huge. It's amazing. Yeah. I kind of feel like they feel like, you know what? Like let's make the SERP like visually entertaining. Like it's something almost like addictive, yeah. like one thing to the next thing, very visual, I'll come back to it again. I love coming to the SERP. It's so much fun. It's absolutely. Again, people forage much more efficiently from a visual standpoint of view. And it is interesting because um, on one hand, it shapes your user journey. My, my, I, can, I don't have the scientific experiment to back this up, but my personal opinion is that people – change their user behavior based on results that they see, right? So for example, when people realize they can type in a whole question in Google search and they get a very good answer, they will do this more often, mm -hmm. right? And I think the same thing happens with visual elements. Like as soon as they know, oh, this is available and I can search this way, then they will make use of that much, much more, right? So from, from Google's perspective, then becomes the question of, okay, how do we tease that to people to see how they react to it? And then the second point is that, um, Google seems to have made huge increments in their understanding of visual search um, by adding the topic layer. Yeah, I love a topic layer. Oh, I'm so thing glad you brought that, that up. Okay, cool. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll jump on that in a second. But uh, that is another part of uh, Ben Gomez's article in 2018. Again, like read this again. It's a, it's a treasure trove of information and, and, and vision. Um, but Ben Gomez also wrote about the topic layer. Um, and... Okay, so maybe I have to dis define the topic layer first. So the topic layer is kind of an extension to the knowledge graph. It sits on top of the knowledge graph, where the knowledge graph really looks at you know entities as in like names, places, books, events, all that kind of stuff. 
The topic layer looks at topics, as the name says. So trends, evergreen ideas, opinions, all that kind of stuff, which is in itself fascinating that Google can map that on a freaking graph and understand the relationships. But in combination, the two are very, very powerful. And one of the results that we already see is Google Discover. Google Discover sits on top of the knowledge graph, uh, sorry, on the topic layer, and provides stunning results without looking at backlinks, without looking at something else, just by understanding the content and how you react to it, right? So, but in this uh, blog article, Ben Gomez also wrote about how they use hundreds of millions of fine relationships between videos and images. Mm. So that gives us an understanding of how far they already were in 2018 and with their whole machine learning super technology that they already have, <laughs> like they, they, they're much further now. So I expect Google to have at least a good understanding of images and videos as they have on text. So, okay. I, I, we're running out of time, but I do want to jump onto the topic layer for a second. It's my, like one of my favorite topics, no pun intended, that we <laughs> don't talk about. Like when, when it came out in October 2018, whatever it was, we're like, oh yeah, topic layer is super cool, super interesting. And then we don't talk about it at all anymore. Just yeah. talk. Talk about the topic layer. Go for it. Whatever you want to say. Oh my God. Yeah. Again, like, I think it's, it's kind of the next step that we really have to understand. It also fits into um, the second and third point that, that Ben Gomez mentioned in this article. So the first one was that they're moving from text to visuals. The second one was that they move from answers to journeys. And the third one is that they move from a query-based search to a query-less search. Right. That is Google Discover. Right. And the, the answers to journeys is also related to the topic layer, but happens in the search results because now Google wants to, excuse me, uh, wants to customize the journey that people have in search by using the knowledge graph integration that is also built on the topic layer. So. Excuse me, you, you see that in a way that when you, for example, look for NBA or NHL or NFL in the US, you will see a whole sports magazine it's in awesome. the search results it's awesome. built on topic layer. You see it all so the time. It's awesome that nobody needs websites. Like no, that. never. I never know. <laughs> Seriously, I go like Steelers yeah. score, Yankees score, and then just forget it. And I, I never go, yeah. unless you want, this, this speaks to like long tail, deep content, which Google can't do yet, at least not yet. I want to look at analysis on whatever team, I go to ESPN. I just want to find a score of the yeah. schedule and never go to ESPN. Yeah, yeah. Even when you look for player names. Right, everything. You see the whole everything. Kind of history, everything. Videos, it's, it's news, so whatever It's so good that they're, they're able – because I think one of the things they do about the topic layer is that it sort of categorizes or breaks down the entity into smaller parts, right? So you can have a team, right? And you have different players. Then you have different positions and how they all relate to each other and how they how what's going on with this position. What's relevant to this team is not that position. What's relevant to this team is this position, whatever it is. And it breaks it down to so many subtopics or sublayers, whatever it is, that you can understand an entity from so many points, but not just going wide, going vertical, but going deep at the same time. That's amazing to me. Yes, absolutely. So again, topic layer to me is something that SEOs need to pay much more attention to because it impacts us in the SERPs and outside of the SERPs. And again, it also opened this whole notion of Google Discover, which is Google's push channel. Google Discover is not based on search. Google Discover is based on suggestions. Yeah. So they also want to don't like wait until a user has a certain need or intent. They want to stimulate more search, right? And more ideas. What do you think about topic layer? Like, I mean, given outside of what you said already. Um, I think it's sort of like you're, you're looking at Google's future. Like you're looking at, at Google's ability to better understand an entity. Um, I'm looking, I can't find the right way to transverse the entity. Like it, it used to be like, let's go back two years ago, right? So you look at I don't know, a movie or, or, or an act would be a better example, like John Travolta. You're getting a very, it's interesting, it's deep, but you're getting a very one-dimensional view of that of that of that entity of that actor in this case. With the topic layer, you're understanding it from like a, I, I, I need a better word from it, but for it, but you're you're understanding the entity from a complete. You're almost understanding it qualitatively. Like, what does it mean yeah. to be this entity? Not just what is this entity, but what does it mean to be this entity? Which is a totally yes, different it, type of understanding. Right. Sorry. And how does it change over time? So let me bring this all the way home. Right. Coronavirus. Coronavirus is actually the family of viruses. It right. is not necessarily what we deal with right now. That is like the disease is COVID-19. But Google was very well able to understand how people use coronavirus in a different sense or in a different um, um, uh, the different context. Now, right. right. So that's I actually looked at this very, very in depth. And so for a long time, um, the WHO page for coronavirus was ranking 
and then for the, for the keyword coronavirus. And then in, the, in early January, Google added more pages about COVID-19 to that ranking mix. So they immediately understood that coronavirus has a different context right now, a different relationship, and they understand that with the topic. I was just talking about this on the podcast last week, not last week from this time's interview, as last week from recording date. If you do something, I was doing like these wacky queries, like, um, what was it? I'm trying to think. Okay, if, I, if I'm pregnant, uh, am I more likely to get a cold? Okay, don't ask me why I was doing that. I was doing it for a research thing. I'm not, because I'm not pregnant. Of course. Right, of course. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And all the STD searches I was doing had nothing to do with my status. It was purely <laughs> research. Um, but COVID-19 results show up. I'm like, that's weird because not what, that's not the intent at all. So I'm like, okay, let's do some more. Let's play around with this. And I started searching for all these like autoimmune things. Like if, I'm, if I have an autoimmune issue because of diabetes, am I more likely to get sick? COVID-19 shows up. Then if I start, if you start inserting like travel and autoimmune, right? If I, the, the, the query I did was if I, if I walk to my backyard and I have an autoimmune deficiency, am I going to get sick? Nothing COVID shows up. But if you insert, instead of walking, you insert traveling, COVID-19 results. Because, and wow. it's, it might, that might sound like, wow, Google's like, you know, it's like getting it right. Dude, it's only been two weeks. I like, give it another week. Google's basically setting it up. They understand COVID-19, autoimmune deficiency, and travel are all totally related to each other. And then if you're searching yeah. for those things, it's COVID-19. Yeah. It's yeah, unbelievable. Absolutely. And it's only been like, you know, two, three weeks, whatever it is. That's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And it's that shows us where the future is going, right? Like Google just getting a much, much better understanding of the of, of consumer changer, uh, sorry, con consumer behavior changes of what people actually mean, yeah. of how people search, like it's it's just going down that route. Being able to break down a concept into layers, well, no pun intended, but into you know subcategories, lets you connect it in totally different ways. It's just, it's yeah. it's amazing. Okay, so we're I don't want to you know I don't want to kill your your time. I know I'm, I'm sure you got places to go, things to see, <laughs> places to be at. Nowhere to go right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but I do have this fun little game that I do. I call it optimize it or disavow it, and it works like this. I'm gonna give you two options. And either I'm going to give you two really good options and you're stuck choosing one good option over another good option. That's uncomfortable. Or I'll give you two really, really bad options and you're stuck choosing one crappy option over another crappy option. That's really uncomfortable. So this is the Kevin Indick version of Optimize It or Disavow It. Now so you, I, I just choose the version. Or yeah, you'll see. Oh, you're, 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 well. All in good time. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, you don't have to say, just choose yeah, the option. Right. You choose the option. You okay. could say it depends. Uh, it's a free country. And it's a free world, whatever it is. <laughs> okay? You can. I'm just, I, just, I discourage it. Okay. okay, okay. Here are your choices, I, okay? Here's what I do. I'll give you a clear-cut answer. Okay. Oh, I'm throwing some things around here. Sorry. I'll give you a clear-cut answer, and then if there is an it depends, then I'll... I'll, I'll explain that later. Okay, that's fine. That's, I, I, that's a fair compromise. I, I appreciate that. All right. Um, so here it is. Like one or the other one, okay? You can either have a URL in a featured snippet that doesn't go to your site, like a, a, a URL to your YouTube channel, let's say, or um, to your Twitter profile or to your whatever social media profile it is, or you can have an organic result that appears underneath that SERP feature. Which one would you take? The one in the SERP feature right away, without a doubt. See, I always think I have Absolutely. a good question. No one ever, it never works out for me. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great question. No, 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 don't be nice. It's okay. I can handle it. I think a lot of people would say uh, the second, but I'm all for the first. Okay, why are you for the first? Because like, on the other hand, it's not to your page. Very true, very true. But I'm, I'm kind of much more about rather not bringing people to my page, but still being a result in the top result, if that makes sense, right? So, I mean, I work at G2, we're a software marketplace. We have a lot of these cases where our customers don't rank for a specific query, like say, uh, best CRM software, but they can rank on our side. The good thing is that they get much higher quality of traffic because that traffic is pre-qualified. Mm. You already know people want this. So I, I see it in the same way with a YouTube channel or a social profile. Like, you know that people come there for specifically that. And then I'd rather try to satisfy that intent instead of with another one. So don't be greedy with your site. <laughs> I'm a little greedy when it comes to that. <laughs> so I, want all the okay. I don't get it, though. Awesome.
Well, thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Hope you stay safe. So we, you know, stay healthy. Um, stay the hell indoors, that kind of thing. And, uh, Same to you, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on, man. It's absolutely. Been a, this is great. Absolute treat and a pleasure. They're so nice. All right. Take care, man. You too. And we are back to your regularly scheduled In Search SEO podcast. He really solved that for me. He really mm-hmm. solved that for me. I always thought you never had to work out your legs because you, you're walking all day long. But the point of the story is, after all the great insights Kevin shared, if you want to have a nice butt, you need to work out your legs. I never knew that. I always was a big upper body person when I used to lift weights. I did. I used to be buff, <laughs> sort of. But I never worked okay, out my well, legs. No one cares. No one That's why I don't have a nice butt. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yep. Long walks on the beach, disco dancing, <laughs> links, <laughs> margaritas. Oh my god! Okay. You can find Sapir on LinkedIn, no, or no. you can call her no. directly at. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> with that, I know I'm getting all the people who want to date you all revved up, so, and, and and as I should, because you are about to take it away, Sapir, with the news. Get ready! At some point in 2021, Google will update its algorithm to consider the user's page experience. What does that mean? It means the new core web vitals in Search Console will count towards your ranking. Yeah, okay, so if you haven't been paying attention, Google um, updated Search Console. You now have these core web vitals instead of just, you know, page speed. Um, And it talks about things like um, LCP, FID, CLS... A lot of abbreviations. That means I'm um, largest contentful paint, um, first input delay, um, cumulative layout shifts. So in other words, um, that last one, CLS, you know when you load a page and all the buttons are moving around and then you accidentally click on something because the buttons are still loading and moving around? Right. That's bad. And Google's going to start looking at it and say, like, bad. Oh, not, <laughs> no, seriously, you can, like, buy something. Like, oh, shoot, they, they move the button around. Bastards. <laughs> um, or, I for example, right. Um, or um, first input delays where, for example, let's say um, the page loads up, you see a link, you click on the link. How long does it take between when you click on that first interactive item, whether it be a link or whatnot, until it actually works? Mm-hmm. So all these different things. By the way, I love the fact that, like, like you know, LCP, like how fast it takes for your, you know, the, 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 that chunk of content to first load up. That's mm-hmm. going to be a ranking factor. That's going to be part of a ranking factor. Right, but Google has said, like, I don't know, like three weeks ago, four weeks ago, Pee! speed is like a nothing. It's like a mega mini, <laughs> it's like a mini ranking factor, man. It's like, it's like totally not a big deal. And now they have this. So, way to keep right. an aligned, on point message, Google. You're very good at this all the time. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I've hijacked your anyway, news. I've hijacked yeah, your news. Moving on. As part of the change to the algorithm in 2021, AMP will no longer be required for the top stories news carousel on mobile. Hell yes! Hell yes! <laughs> Who said this? Who said this three weeks ago oh. on a deep thought that is found on the Twitter page for this podcast where I was complaining? I, it's, it's on record. And there's a date stamp on the tweet saying that Google, when it updated COVID-19 news carousels, it said, hey, you know, we don't need to have AMP here. And I said, you do this for everything, all news. Well, now they okay. will be doing it. Mm-hmm. So Google job, clearly man. cares what I have to say. Right. Or is it a Here giant you coincidence? You pick. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Hell yes. Move on. <laughs> there may be an issue related to the way in which Google indexes content. Many are complaining that indexing has slowed and there is speculation that it's tied to the May core update. Google says nothing is wrong. Move move along. Move along. Nothing to see here. These are not the droids you're looking for. (laughs) Move along. Uh, Another uh, tidbit about this, and I was talking to uh, Ari Nachmani of um, Kahina Twitter about this, is that, uh, and I saw this myself, when you update a title tag, I'm seeing and already was seeing that it's taking a long time or longer than usual time for Google to pick up on the change you made to your title tag. So maybe that's related. Who knows? But anyway, nothing is wrong. Move along. These are not the droids you're looking for. Right. Move along more. Move along. Okay. The future is now. Ooh, that's good. That was, that's very marked. The future is now. <laughs> Google is By the way, the future is now, then it'll be the present, not the future. Thank you, Morty. Just wanted you to know that. Okay. Margaritas, yeah, long okay. walks on the beach, links. <laughs> let's go dancing. 
Let me continue. Five 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 two three one eight six two one. Google is officially testing using voice co- confirmation for certain p- purchases made within Google Assistant. I will save my comments here for a deep thought, but they could be summarized as womp womp. <laughs> okay, lastly, there was a lot of chatter of a local update to the algorithm since the start of May. Over the past few weeks, local SEOs have been complaining that, that a change to the algorithm has made local results worse. It turns out that it was not a change to the algorithm, but a bug. Yeah, that's not good. I will, I will say I was looking at a bunch of local queries, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago. I'm like, this is weird. I'm having a hard time finding. I was like entering very specific business names, like, you know, like Walmart on First Street. And I was having a hard time getting what I wanted, which was weird. I thought that, that was weird. That's weird. And it was weird. And now it's officially weird. Right. Awesome. Thank you, okay. Sapir. Um, as I mentioned... Deep thought. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna talk about Google testing their voice confirmation. Blah 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 blah. Womp womp. On a deep thought, which will be found on the Twitter page for the In Search SEO podcast, which is the podcast you're currently listening to. In case you didn't know the name of it. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, with that, let's head off to our last little segment here. My favorite little segment here. Your favorite little segment here. The fun SEO send off question. So, Sapir, what enlightening question do you have for us this week? Oh, God. Okay, so. I have a question. If you want to date Sapir, oh, God, what up. phone number should all the people who want to sell you links call you at? Oh, okay. Just first so three digits. Five, five, question. five. First three digits. Come on. So, the fun send-off question of this week. Where is, would you take Sapir on your first date after selling her links? Can you shut up? Okay. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> this week we're asking, what musical act would Google be embarrassed to lis- to admit listening to? Ooh, that's good. I know. <laughs> that's good. Okay, Sapir. Oh. What do you think? As I so process I this question. Go- <laughs> <laughs> so you know there is a, a recent uh like popular trend if you said a recent and popular marketing. trend then i have no yeah, idea I know. sorry sorry there no is, i'm there a boomer is, there is a popular trend there is a popular trend like in recent years um to hate on nickelback oh okay yeah. that's not recent years that's when like i i know that very well nickelback sucks yes what i listen i grew up listening to them <sighs> i love their i love their music it's like right up there with creed know. ugh what Please. saving me is a gem like hero come on spider-man he needs what? to go back to his trailer write new music come back out <laughs> try that again they have some good songs okay yeah if you say so anyway so nickelback yeah. that's who google will not so be embarrassed that's... listening to <laughs> that's a good answer actually i like that i know that's a very musically astute answer <laughs> Let me heap on the praise as I try to uh, figure out my answer. But very good, Nickelback. That's good. I know the I fact know. that you like them is not so great, but what is is to no, be? I like, oh wait, wait, wait. I like their old stuff. It's nostalgic. Stop for one second. So now it's long walks on the beach, margaritas, <laughs> links, disco dancing, and Nickelback. <laughs> They're old music, though. I don't know. I I haven't listened to them in for, years. There's, there's, you know, is have, there any music? Have some good stuff. Okay. Millie Vanilli, that's my answer. Google will not be embarrassed listening to Millie Vanilli because Google's not embarrassed to rip off SERP features from Bing and say, hey, these are ours. That wasn't the question. They're not embarrassed. The question is what musical act would Google be embarrassed? Oh, would it be embarrassed? Oh, my bad. I went the totally wrong way. Oh, wow. I don't have an answer to that now. One second. would, would, Would they be embarrassed? Yeah, to, listen to. to admit listening to. Mm-hmm. Um, See, you, you keep I'm going to say James Taylor. I'm going to say James Taylor. Who? James Taylor. I have no idea who that is. And um, that will end the show because I don't have any reason other than the fact that I was listening to James Taylor earlier. And you're like, everyone's like, oh, my God, you're such a loser listening to James. I like James Taylor. Okay. <laughs> I have an eclectic musical taste. I, I, I like I like Black Sabbath. I like James Taylor. I like the Stone Temple Pilots. Mm-hmm. I like the Chili Peppers. I like Billy Joel. 
I have a very eclectic musical taste. Right. But I think they would be embarrassed listening to James Taylor because it would just show how old Google – oh, that's a good reason because it would show how, Google, how old Google actually is. They're old. They're okay. like 22 years old, something like that. Yeah, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. All right. With that, we're going to call it a show. Don't forget to check out the bonus coverage of the podcast on the Twitter page. In search underscore SEO on Twitter. Deep thoughts. Check that out on Twitter. And don't forget, new episode of the In Search SEO podcast next Tuesday. Look for it wherever great podcasts are found or on the Ray Granger blog. Thank you so much for tuning in. And don't forget, it's, well, it's good in search because we're all in search of something. Toodaloo. Toodaloo. <laughs> Toodaloo.